after studying this module you shall be able to know what is a skull to learn the anatomy of a skull and to identify the different types of bones present in the skull to introduce you the topic a skull is the bony structure enclosing and protecting the brain in an adult eight cranial bones are fused together by means of sutures anatomically on the joint of vertebral column an oval shaped skull is positioned which is broader behind than in the interior it is separable into two portions cranium consists of eight bones and the bones of the face consist of 14 bones the cranial bones are occipital two parietals one frontal two temporals sphenoid ethmoid while as the facial bones are two nasals two maxilla lacrimal zygomatic palatine two lesser nasal conchi vomer and the mandible hyoid bone is also positioned at the core of the tongue and linked to the bottom of the skull by ligament the detailed description of each cranium bone uh, can be viewed on the supplied photograph let's see the cranial bones in detail the occipital bones it is located at the posterior and inferior portion of the cranium it is trapezoid in shape and bent on itself it is perforated by a great oval aperture that is the foramen magnum through which the cranial cavity interconnects with the vertebral canal if you see the surface of that occipital bone the external surface is convex and present midway between the joint of the bone and the foramen magnum a prominence that is the external occipital protuberance the inner superficial part is intentionally concave and separated into four fossa by cruciate eminence the lateral part are positioned at the side of the foramen magnum on their beneath surface are the condyles for articulation by superior facets of the atlas that is the first cervical vertebra the condyles are oval or uniform in shape and their anterior extremities are directed forwards and medially are closer together than their posterior and encroach on the basilar part of the bone the following margins extend back to the level of the central of the foramen magnum the foramen magnum is a big oval orifice with its lengthy thickness the anterior posterior it is broader behind and interior where it is impinged on by the condyles we see the articulations of the occipital bone it articulates with six bones that is two parietals two temporals the sphenoid and the atlas sphenoid in front so after occipital bone now let's see the parietal bones the parietal bones the parietal bone forms by their combination the side and the top of the cranium every bone is irregular four sided in arrangement and has two planes four boundaries and four angles as i told you there are two parietals the external surface is curved even and noticeable nearby the midpoint by an eminence called the parietal eminence which specifies the portion where the ossification commenced at the posterior portion and near to the higher or sagittal boundary is the sagittal foramen the inferior superficial surface is curved it has depressions consistent to the cerebral obscurities besides the higher boundary is a narrow furrow which collectively with that on the opposite parietal forms a network known as the sagittal sulcus in between if we see the articulations of the parietal bones they articulate with five bones that is the opposite parietal the occipital the frontal the temporal and sphenoid at the base now let's see the frontal bone the frontal bone looks like a cockle shell in arrangement and comprises of two portions a perpendicular part called as the squama in relation with the area of the forehead and an orbital or straight part which goes into creation of the roof of the orbital and nasal cavities we see the surface of the frontal bone 
the external surface of this portion is convex and generally displays in the inferior portion of the central line the residues of the frontal or metopic suture on both side of this suture separates the bone into two which lies overhead the supraorbital margins the frontal eminence this is the frontal eminence the superciliary arches are projecting medially and are combined to each other by an even rays called as the glabella the supraorbital margins finishes along in the zygomatic process which is tough and projecting and articulates with the zygomatic bone in succession rising and regressive from this process is a specified line that is the temporal line which divides into the upper and temporal lower temporal lines continuous in the articulated skull with the consistence line on the parietal bone the interior area is curved and displays in the higher portion of the central line a perpendicular furrow the sagittal sulcus the boundary of which tie below to form a bridge now let's see the facial bones the facial bones as i told you are 14 in number the nasal bones they have got dual minor oblong bones variable in magnitude and arrangement in dissimilar persons they are positioned alongside at the central and upper part of the face by their intersection at the association of the nose so this is the portion where the nasal bones will be there if we see the articulations the nasal bone articulates with four bones two of the cranium the frontal and ethmoid and two of the face the contrasting nasal and the maxilla now let's see the maxilla bone the maxilla are the chief bones of the face except the mandible and arrangement by their combination constitute the entire of the higher jaw all these help in creating the borders of three cavities namely the roof tuff of the mouth the ground and side wall of the nose and ground of the orbit it also arrives into creation of two fossa the infratemporal and the pterygo palatine and two fissures the lesser orbital and the pterygo maxillary all bones contain a body and four processes that is zygomatic frontal alveolar and palatine if you see the articulations of the maxilla bone the maxilla articulates with nine bones two of the cranium that is the frontal and ethmoid and seven of the face that is the nasal the zygomatic the lacrimal the inferior nasal concha the palatine and vomera both side from time to time it articulates with the orbital surface and occasionally with the adjacent pterygoid plate of this sphenoid now let's see the lacrimal bone the lacrimal bone is the minutest and most fragile bone of the face it is located at the obverse position of the medial wall of the orbit it has two sides and four boundaries we see the articulations of lacrimal bone it articulates with four bones two of the cranium that is the frontal and ethmoid two of the face that is the maxilla and uh, maxilla and the inferior nasal concha the zygomatic bone or the cheek bone the zygomatic bone is a small and quadrangular and is situated at the upper and lateral part of the face it forms the prominence of the cheek part of the lateral wall and lat and floor of the orbit and parts of the temporal and infratemporal fossa it presents a malar and a temporal surface four processes are the fronto sphenoidal orbital maxillary and temporal as well as four borders we see the articulations of the zygomatic bone it articulates with four bones namely the frontal the sphenoidal the temporal and the maxilla now the vomers the vomers are situated in the median plane but its anterior portion is frequently bent to one or other side it is thin somewhat quadrilateral in shape and forms the hinder and lower part of the nasal septum 
the articulations if we see of the vomer it articulates with six bones two of the cranium that is the sphenoid and ethmoid and four of the face that is the two maxillae and the two palatine bones it also articulates with the septal cartilage of the nose now let's see the cranial sutures sutures are defined as junctions or lines of articulation between adjacent bones of the skull a suture is a type of fibrous joint which only occur in the skull or cranium they are bound together by sharpies fibers a tiny amount of movement is permitted at sutures which contributes to the elasticity of the skull now let's see the types of sutures present in the skull the coronal suture that is the junction between the frontal and parietal bones here it is situated the lambdoid suture junction between the parietals and the occipital bones the sagittal suture the junction between the left and right parietal bones the frontal or the metopic suture junction between the two frontal bones the occipitomastoid sutures the junction between the sphenoid and temporal bones then the parietomastoid suture junctions between the parietal and temporal bones then this phenofrontal suture junctions between the sphenoid and frontal bones then there is sphenoparietal suture that is the junction between the sphenoid and parietal bones then is phenosquamosal suture junction between the sphenoid and temporal bone squamous part of the temporal bone the sphenozygomatic suture junction between the sphenoid and zygomatic bones then squamosal suture that is the junction between the parietal and temporal bones then zygomatico temporal suture junction between the zygomatic and temporal bones and then the zygomatico frontal suture that is the junction between the zygomatic and frontal bones now let's see the understand the difference between a male and female skull we see the general size the size of the masculine skull is larger whereas female skull is comparatively smaller than male skull if we see the architecture the male skull is rugged or rough and female skull is smooth and gracile because they have lesser muscle attachments the supra orbital ridges it is the region which is directly above the orbit and nose of the bro ridges and it is much prominent in the males as compared to females the male orbits are squarish with rounded margins and in females it is distinguished by a roundish shape and sharp margins the forehead is known as frontal bone in males skull forehead is more steeper or sloping whereas in females it is more vertical and rounded the glabella which is the point between eyebrows where this females used to put kumkum or tikka or bindi in the in our indian culture in males this glabella is well developed and whereas it is less developed or ill developed in females we see the zygomatic arches it is the bony arch below the eye socket forms the fusion of the cheek bone and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone it is the special characteristic which is more pronounced or robust and tends to extend in males and whereas in females it is less pronounced and tends not to extend beyond the external auditory meatus if we see the mastoid process which is located in the inferior portion of the temporal bone just posterior to the external auditory meatus in males it is larger and massive whereas in females it is smaller and more pointed if we see the external occipital protuberance it is the prominent feature of the masculine skull and it shows well development whereas in female it is less developed we see the maxillary bone or the cheek bones in males it shows more massive heavier appearance and placed more laterally and in females it is slender lighter and more compressed then there are certain pathologies in the skull the most frequent fatal malformation of the skull is anencephaly a condition in which the cranial vault is never developed and the rudimentary brain is directly exposed this condition is not infrequently combined with incomplete or whole failure of the closure of the neural canal that is the craniorachis the skull bottoms show marked deformities of its constituent bones 
the skull vault is absent and the orbits may be rudimentary. A common malformation compatible with life is the uni or bilateral absence of combination of the globular and maxillary processes resulting in various degrees of hair lip and cleft palate. The defect is situated between the lateral incisor and the canine tooth. The congenital herniation of meninges and brain will present on the skull bones as round midline defect above the association of the nose or in the occipital area, premature synostosis of one or numerous cranial sutures result in many specific skull irregularities noticeably dissimilar from social or artificial deformations. The increasing pressure of the growing brain leads to separation of open sutures and deep cerebral impressions on the inner table. Now let's see the paleopathology of the cleft lip and cleft palate. These abnormalities are uncommon in archaeological skeletons. However, this does not mean that cleft palate were rare in uh, antiquity. A noted scientist Tretzwen found the occurrence of cleft abnormalities among living American Indians in Montana to be higher than non-Indian pupil. He further notes that many American Indian groups have descriptive terms for cleft abnormalities in their native language. Mortality of newborns with fogged lip and or palate would have been high in antiquity. The defect inhibits effective nursing which would have contributed to early death. Also many infants with grossly observable deformities would have been killed. Uh, scientist Bandorfer in 1962 has described a female skull about 25 to 30 years of age excavated in southern Hungary and dated to the 15th century AD. The only abnormality of the skull is a poorly developed premaxilla and a small defect of the inferior aspect of the right pyriform aperture. The anterior alveolar margin of the maxilla has a slight indentation suggestive of a cleft lip. The incisors are missing, antimortem and the sockets for their roots are not present. Bandorfer rules out gingival atrophy following antimortem loss of the incisors because the remaining teeth are normal. He does not consider cultural artificial extraction of the teeth as a possible cause of the slight defect in the alveolar bone. However, the abnormality of the pyriform aperture and subnormal development of the premaxilla would support a diagnosis of slight cleft lip. Brooks and Hohenthal in 1963 report the presence of cleft abnormalities in three indigenous skulls from two archaeological cemeteries in California, United States of America. Two of these skulls are from Newark site on the southeastern shore of the San Francisco Bay. The skull came from the late middle horizon level dated uh, by carbon 14 dating to 2340 years before. The skulls are stored in the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, USA. The third skull is from a site in the Sacramento County in California and is dated between 2000 and 4000 years from a male about 30 to 40 years of age. Both the maxilla and palate have cleft defects. The upper right incisors were missing antimortem. The mandible is, was reported to be normal and one skull is also male with an estimated age between 22 and 25 years. The nasal bones are abnormal but the picture is obscured by postmortem damage. Both the maxilla and palate have cleft type defects. The extensive nature of the facial abnormality added to the general porosity of the bones of the forehead and face are atypical of cleft palate and lip. The author suggested the possibility of injury although they concluded that cleft abnormality is the best interpretation of the defect. The cranium is a female skull between 25 and 28 years of age. The skull has a marked unilateral loss of bone of the alveolar portion of the right maxilla. There are also extensive inferior bony projections on the maxilla near the suture with the zygomatic bone. The authors concluded that this is a case of unilateral hair lip. 
Such a possibility should be kept in mind in studying pale paleopathological specimens with abnormalities of the maxilla and palate. Dairy in 1938 reported two examples of agenesis of the premaxillary region of the maxilla. The first example is a skull from 25th dynasty Egyptian site on the east side of the river Nile. Now to summarize the topic, the skull consists of 8 cranial bones and 14 facial bones. Sutures are fixed interlocking junctions that link skull bones together. Cranial fossae are three depressions in the floor of the cranium. These fossae called the frontal, middle and lateral cranial fossae provides spaces that accommodate the shape of the brain. Nasal cavity is made by the cartilage and numerous bones. Air inflowing the cavity is warmed and rinsed by coating lining the cavity.